Hello, um, welcome back to, I don't know, my vlog, I suppose. Uh, today we're going to talk about the FinOps connector. Now, the FinOps connector within Power Automate in particular. Um, I feel like the FinOps connector has gotten not a lot of love, if I'm being honest with you all. And those who are techie, I can understand why. Um, but what I was hoping to do is I'm going to go, go through the whole connector. We're going to talk about connecting up to it different limitations that you have, um, how to use it for all of the different commands as well. Um, and over the course of the day, or over the course of the time, um, my views on it all. So it's got to be a little bit of fun. It's not a hugely serious session. It is designed for those who are learning about um, Power Automate and starting to learn what Power Automate can do um, within finance and operations, particularly from a self-service or end-user point of view. So let's get started. Here we are within Power Automate, and this is the view that we get when we first log on in. So to play along with all of this, you are going to need access to Power Automate. And if you have an Office 365 license, you're in. Or if you have a finance and operations license, you're also in. You're also going to need access to a finance and operations environment within your tenant. That's really important, particularly if there's any consultants that are playing along and watching this. If your um your UT and then your email addresses are you know J Simpson UT and then the that part there, it needs to be the same as what the what the environment tenant is in. So here we have our lovely power automate and we're going to start off we're actually going to as we talk through this we're just going to do a blank automate um but there's a whole bunch of templates which are really really cool and really easy to use and we'll talk about those in a moment so let's click on create as we talk through the different elements of the connector so i'm just going to do a manual one which is triggered by a button and we'll talk about how we can trigger and automate from within finance and operations as well. So here we are. The very first thing we want to do is connect to the right D365. Because when you type in Dynamics 365, you're going to be greeted by quite a few different little options. So, and what I've seen most often is this one here being used and people often struggle with this. They'll click on this because it's the D that we all know, but it's not the right one. This one here is the customer insights one, which again, we don't want. We want the purple one. So if you want to connect to finance and operations or FinOps, even they've called it Fin and Ops, you want the purple one. And that's the same as the logo that we have on the website. So when we click on this, we have a range of different actions that we can do. And we're going to talk about all of these actions. Now, these are all classified as premium, which to me means you need to have a finance and operations license as well. Um, and let's start off with, we'll start at the very top, creating a record. So when you do this, you're gonna be asked to sign in and you'll sign in with your Office 365 account, the same account that you use to sign into finance and operations. From here, we're going to select the environment that you have access to. Now, if you're a client or an end user, you're probably not going to have that many environments that you have access to. If you're a partner, you're probably going to have quite a lot. So it's going to make a little bit of sense just to start typing it um, rather than showing you all the ones that we have access to. Um, but essentially, you just click on the little drop down arrow there. To find out what the instance is called, it's essentially the first part of your URL. So you could probably just, if you wanted to, copy copy that element and paste it in here. So once we have access to the instance, we then need to choose the entity. Um, now coming from a functional point of view, this is a little bit hard because there are so many entities and they're increasing with every month. Um, and yet, at the same time, there are so little entities. Um, so finding out what entity you need to do is often quite hard. The best tip that I can offer to you is if you go into finance and operations and you go into any sort of view, we'll go um, to all customers, for example, under sales ledger, all customers, okay. The magic little open in Excel button, when you click on that one, that's the one that's going to help you figure out what your entity is called and what to connect to. And it's just going to load up and it's only going to take a second and we'll show it to you then. Here in all customers. So 
what do you want to do to figure out what kind of entities you are in or you have access to or that you can play around with is the lovely little open in Excel office button open in Excel if you click on that if you see open in Excel these are going to be the entities that you have access to if it just says export to Excel you no use unfortunately so the one we want is called customers you okay something you'll note right now is that this is limited to the legal entity that you are in and flow has similar sort of restrictions as well um, there's also the case of sometimes the entities are a bit hidden but from a functional point of view Flow is essentially here to help you do the stuff that you do manually in the system. So you should be able to look on the open in Excel to find out the entities. It's just a starter for 10, but it's for me, it's a really easy and quick way to figure out, does this have an entity or not? So here is our customer one. So we will just literally type in customers. Okay, and here we have it with the customers and the customers v3. I prefer to go for the v3. Okay, and that's just going to take a moment to find that table. So what happens then is all of the fields that are available in that entity will now populate along with um, key information. So key information such as currency and customer group. So the system has determined that these are the two key fields that we have to have to have in order for this to populate. So we can easily set this up. We can just say all room GBP and our customer group ID, we're using numbers in this environment. So let's just continue on with 10. So from within here, you can then fill in all of the fields that you want to. Um, maybe you've gotten the information from Excel prior, or maybe it's come from our Canvas app or, or even a, a model driven app as well. So we can then start entering in the information that is required. By not entering in a company ID, we're sending it to our default company ID. And sometimes you can have a multi-legal entity uh, flow where it does uh, impact multiple entities, but nine times out of 10, it's going to use what your default legal entity is. To figure out what your default legal entity is, you want to click on settings and then go into your user options. When the user options, it's going to show you the environment that you need to access or the, your, your default legal entity. The options, we go into preference, and this here, USMF in this example, is what my default legal entity is. And so it'll always, when I send the information through Power Automate, go into here. There's a bunch of really smart workarounds that are available um, online on how to switch your legal entity. Um, and you can do that via Flow as well. You can update your legal entity. Something really cool to notice is just because a field is here doesn't mean you have to populate it. If, for example, your tax groups come a default from your customer group, leave the tax group clear and it will automatically pull through the default information. That works everywhere. So if you're creating a journal and you select the, uh, you're doing an invoice journal and you select the vendor, then all of the vendor defaults are going to flow on in as well. So it's really, really powerful to not fill in information, which I know goes against our key, you know, Key, what we want to do all the time is we want to have every single field filled in but just leave it blank um, if you want to default in so I'm gonna try and find a name or something so that we can do this nice and quickly uh, there's a whole bunch of fields on here so if we just search for name we'll be able to well one of 28 hey um, invoice name phonetic name address name, children's name. I mean, it is sometimes really hard trying to figure out which name you actually want to fill in. Um, but you, know, you can kind of look at it with a little bit of um, little bit of logic, to be honest with you. That's relief group, even though it says names, we definitely don't want that. We want the organization name. So we'll call this Julia Power Automate. Okay, that's as simple as we're going to make it for now because Again, doing a live demo, the more things you fill in, the more chances you have of something going wrong. So, and it's as simple as that. What you would do is if you were connecting it to Excel, you could add in dynamic fields as well. To add in a dynamic field, if we click over here to the side, you'll see here, here are all the fields that are in our previous steps. So if we're triggering a throw, I can put in the username. 
instead um, for the customer name if I so wanted to. Um, maybe under primary contact, and that's for asking for a contract person attribute, um, which we won't do. So, radio. It's as simple as that. So you you connect to it, you select your entity for create a record, and then you fill in the fields that you want. You can make them a dynamic or you can make them fixed, but also try to remember to use blanks with power so you can get those defaults. We'll save this, and we'll now test it on out. Okay, this is a nice simple little test because I'm manually triggering this flow and I'm not feeding any information onto my record. So this will now run and it's going to create a lovely new little record for us. And it should hopefully do it within a couple of seconds as well. Okay, so that is now created and in a lot slower time than I would expect because again, um, for those who you are used to cloud environments, you shut them down at night, you turn them on and they're always slow. Um, generally speaking, I would expect this to take around three or so seconds. Um, but that has created our record and you'll notice here that it's given us a customer account. And remember what I said about leaving default fields blank. So that's going to be in customer number 26. So if I now find anything that contains 0026, actually I'll copy the whole number. That will make life easier for us. Okay, here we go. And here is our lovely little customer that we just created. And again, the account number has defaulted on, so that's really, really lovely. Um, language has defaulted in, and any other customer fields that may be there have defaulted. Account statement has defaulted to always. Uh, different fields have defaulted to no as usual. Um, without us having to tell it, it just defaults to what the standard one is when you first create. And if we had financial dimensions, they would probably default in as well as any particular VAT information. But this IT customer group hasn't been set up with any. Now, how to understand this whole connector when your flow runs, because you need to be able to read and see what is going on. Um, if we click on create record, we can see this is what we gave it. These are the inputs and this is what we got. So the body itself is what I usually look at. And to be honest with you, I, I find this little box really, really hard to read. So to re understand this, I usually open up Notepad++, which I have just for Power Automate. And this, when I paste it into here, it's a lot simpler to read. And I can go through and I can have a look at all of the different fields. And also then it will give you your error messages as well, which makes life a lot easier to understand. So that is create record. Let's have a look at the next one. I'm going to delete this. I'm going to move on to the next connector. All right, list items present in a table is our next connector. And this one is actually a lot of fun and actually really, really useful. So again, we're going to connect to the data that we into our environment. And now we're going to select the entity. So for in this example, I'm going to click on purchase order. Oh, it's all one sentence, isn't it? Order headers. And always go for the second version or the third version if there is a V something. So we're going to look at purchase order headers. So what this one is going to do is it's going to give us all the records in our purchase order header entity for our default legal entity. And that's fantastic. But where the power comes in is here in the ability to filter and maybe do the top 10 or the top 100 or whatever you need to do. And also, if you're lucky, some entities also have this cross company. So you can look at multiple legal entities, which is really, really awesome. It's worthwhile noting that you don't want to do this to, you know, you don't want to do huge loads of data for this. Whilst, whilst we're here, Power Automate is not a data migration tool and it's not a reporting tool. Please use different options for that. We have data management, which is great for data migration. Um, and we have a whole bunch of Azure, imp Azure options for bulk reporting. So Power Automate is designed for users. It's not an integration tool. That's what Logic Flows is for. This is designed for the user each day to help improve the day-to-day -day tasks. So we have the ability to aggregate data. I've never particularly touched that one. The one that I particularly play around with a lot is OData filtering. 
OData filtering is really a lot of fun and really useful to play around with, but you need to know the field that you want to filter on and you need to know the dynamics talk. I've actually done a blog around filtering, um, particularly for purchase order headers and lines in terms of the statuses. For the moment, I'm not going to actually filter for anything, and I do this every time. I always run the whole process for everything, but I will just do the first 10 records because that's going to give me enough information so I can then figure out what my filter fields need to be, and I can then apply them in. So we're going to connect to purchase order headers. I'm going to give us our top 10. And now we'll just run this. We'll perform the trigger. And we're going to, again, we're going to be end up copying and pasting this into Notepad++ once it's finished. Okay, it's getting quicker. And again, the environment's up to date now. So it's, it's starting to wake up a little bit. It's a, it, it had put itself to bed. So I'm going to copy all this information. Um, if you don't know the shortcut, just click in there and it's Control A. Anyone who loves Excel will know Control A. And we'll paste it on into here. And so this is all of the information. So we can then start to scroll down and I can see, okay, well, that's my purchase order number. And that's my bank document. And that's my status. Now, status. This one is harder because whilst for us, it looks like it's purchase order status and it's invoiced is the field we want to filter on. It doesn't actually mean that behind the scenes, there's some extra information. I'll put a link into my blog that talks about how to filter on status. Okay, so we'll, what we'll do is we'll, we'll filter by payment terms equals net 30. What I have done for this one, particularly for transfer orders, it's quite useful. You can say anything that's due to arrive today. Um, or we could say anything that is as a due delivery date of today or a due shipping date of today. And that way you can have it, get yourself a nice little email each day that says this is what's due. Maybe you want to have anything that was created yesterday as well. So for the purpose of this, this is the field that we're going to do. So you have to copy it exactly. It's very, very touchy and you need to have the right capital letters. That is key. If you don't have it, if I just put like lowercase payment terms name, it's not going to pick up on it, which is why I always put it into Excel so that I have the exact information that I want it to be. So now here on my filter query, I'm going to paste that in and that's nice and happy. There's no spaces around it. This is one of my complaints about Power Automate is that you have to be exact. You have to be really, really, really detailed on this one because if you accidentally put two spaces in here it's gonna error up on you which you just don't want and it's going to give you emotional it's going to give me grief anyway definitely did and a lot of the times i've spent hours on this because even my capital letter wasn't right um i had lowercase i had an extra space i didn't have a bracket around it um you know there are plenty of chances to make mistakes um rightio so we're back here on name and i'm going to do a space so if I was doing this in Excel, I would then go equals and then space and I say net 30. That's how I would do it in Excel. We have to use techie talk on this one and reference to O data. So instead of the equal sign, it's EQ. Okay, and the filtering abilities that we have, we can say greater than, which is GT, less than, which is, well, LT. E and EQ are the, the key ones that you're really going to use, uh, or at least that I use as well. There is another blog on OData um, filtering abilities. I'll try to find that and link it in. It's a Microsoft blog. And so that will help you with the different, you can't do a lot, but you can do less than, greater than, equals to um, other main ones. You can't do contains. That's one of the downsides that I have about this OData filtering. Um, but there's, of course, ways to get around it. You would list all the all the records that you needed to, and then you might do on the next step another search, anything that contains. It does do a little bit loopy, though, so it's not very efficient, if you ask me. So I've done replace my equal sign with EQ, um, and now I need to put some little brackets around my net 30. Now, you don't want to do those sorts of brackets. Um, particularly if you're using dynamic fields, you want to stick with a single bracket. I've never done this with hand typed information, so I may need to come back and put a double bracket around it. But for the moment, let's try single brackets. 
and see if that works. Again, I'm going to stick in the top 10 because I need to just make it run quicker. Um, the more information it needs to pull, the longer it's going to take. Okay, so that's running now. We'll see if that works or if that's going to error up because I didn't do a double bracket. Okay, that worked. So it's a single bracket on this situation. So that's pulled this information in so I can now copy this all. And again, you guessed it, chuck it into Notepad++. Occasionally when the tabs get over to here, I just end up closing them all down. And here we have all of the records, the top 10 records, which have a payment term of net 30. If I scroll down enough, I can see that's the end of one record. Here's the beginning of another. And again, I can see payment terms will be somewhere. Here it is, net 30. I can keep on going down until I get to the 30 records. Now, the reason why we may want to do this is essentially to get all that information that to then do something with it. So maybe we want to put them into a nice little table and email it out in a, um, on Outlook, or and we can use the Outlook connector for there. Maybe we want to update something else. Um, maybe we want to feed them into a BI report, for example, or send it through on a Teams message. Look at all the different lines um, that are due today and post it into a Teams group saying these are the invoices, these are the orders that are due today. Um, you want to be careful that you don't use it again for an integration tool, particularly if it's high volume, a lot of volumes. You do need to pay a little bit of attention to what you're using it for. The benefit is if you do find that you are pushing Power Automate to its max and A, it's costing too much or you're just using it too much and it's not being as reliable as you want, you can export it and import it and get it set up really, really easily into Logic Apps, which is Power Automate's bigger brother. Um, right here. So we are down the second connector. Let's look at the third one. Um, now, whilst I'm here, again, once you've gotten your record, either you've created your record or you've deleted your record, you can then do stuff with it. So if I just send myself an email, for example, from here, I'm going to send an email. Okay. I now have all of the information that I've gotten up above that I can list into here so I can link in purchase order. And this is going to send me, what it's done is done an automatic loop because it's seen that I have multiple records in my table here. Um, so for each purchase order, it's going to send me an email. I'd have to chuck this into a table if I wanted it to not send me an email, for every, for, for, for send me 10 emails, um, which you can do as well using some of these standard connectors. If we have a look at some of the standard ones and we search for like a HTML table. Um, where is it? Going back to all data operations. There it is. Create a CSV and create a HTML. You can create little tables in Power Automate and then attach that table into an email, which is really fun. Actually, it's a good little bit of fun. This one, I really do like list items. It has a lot of power, which I find really fascinating um, to be honest with you all. So let's connect up to Dynamics 365 once more, finance and operations. Of course, there is no other. And we can use it also to delete a record. So I'm actually not going to, we'll talk again through the whole process so you can understand how it works. Um, and we can delete the customer that we just created because the customer there hasn't got any um, transactions against it. So it can be deleted. You have to be careful with deleting because yeah, if you have, um, if it, you can't, if this won't let you do anything that you can't do manually. So I can't come into all customers and delete, um, one of our standard customers that has transactions against it. Cause that's just not how dynamics works. You shouldn't be able to do that. And neither should power automate. This will only let you do what you can do manually. So whilst this customer here has just been created, I can delete it. So let's practice deleting it. So something that it's going to want is your object ID. And that can be a little bit hard to figure out if you've never done this before. So let's just start off by putting in our customer number so I can show you how we figure out what our object ID is. Essentially, we want it to error. Um, because what, unfortunately, it doesn't tell you a good message until it errors up, um, which it, that's fine. 
you do what you want to do, my darling. Um, so, but we have to figure out what the error is. Learning Power Automate is a lot about errors. You're going to make mistakes again and again and again. Okay, so here it said only one or two keys have been provided. Yep, that's right. Uh, we need data area ID and customer account. So that's given us our link, our hint of what we need to do. So we need the legal entity and the customer account. So if we go back in here, we can now amend it. We go USMF and then comma. No spaces here, guys. Don't do any spaces. Just do the one field, the next field. We'll see if this works, but we may need to again amend this information to have brackets and double bra and double bra or double brackets around it. Again, there's probably someone who knows this, um, who's a bit more techy than myself, will know exactly when to use one bracket or when to use two brackets. But for the purpose of this, I, you know, there's better off making a mistake. So again, it's had a look. Um, okay, so it's telling me here that I cannot be deleted while I have a aggregate risk score. Um, so I need to delete the risk information. Now this is quite fascinating because whilst this customer is brand new, I personally didn't set up any credit management information behind it. But due to the wonderful nature of the new credit functionality, it automatically will give it a risk score. If you want to know more about credit and credit management and the new functionality, just give me a ping because it's something I've been contemplating doing a a blog on as well. So we're now going to have a look at our next action. So we've created, we've list all records, we've delete, we've attempted to delete. Um, let's again connect to the Dynamics Finance and Operation Connector and we now have executing an action. So this is one of the ones that gets you incredibly excited until you realize what it can do. Um, it is, it is a lovely one, but the out-of-the-box actions are desirable, to say the least. Um, you can cancel a job. Okay. You can look at, I mean, bill of materials information. I don't, I don't know much about bill of materials myself, but you can activate and you can approve them, which is lovely. If you're doing anything around budget transfer and budget controls, you have actions for those, which could be quite useful as well. And any again with anything with work budget planning worksheets, like lots and lots and lots around budget planning and budget registry as well, which is really cool. Nothing as useful from a finance point of view as posting a journal, but you know what? It's a starter for ten, and hopefully as time goes along, we'll get more. And there's also a, it's really easy for developers to create new actions as well. So we can have a look at the business events, which is what this connects to. We can have a look at cash flow information um, or have a look at our, look up a currency exchange rate by the looks of it. Um, a lot here around data management, which actually that is quite useful to be honest with you, such as exporting different packages, getting information. That, that's very powerful in the long grand schema of things. Um, we can have a look at the dimension combination values, that semi-value, and having a look at document routing or routing depending on where you're from on the planet information as well so this starts to get a little bit techy um particularly we've got a whole bunch of dual right information now as well um from an accountant point of view or a financial point of view there's not a huge amount that we can do um yet yet um but it is getting better and better um Every time I look at this, there's new stuff. So we can have a look at financial information. We've got the period and close stuff and uh, different transfer stuff as well. What I think is the most useful part is the workflow elements, uh, workflow action. So you can complete a workflow. You can validate a workflow. These are very, very useful. Um, I'm not going to do any of the actions here. I was just showing off the ability that they do have some um from an account as I said from an account point of view they're they're not the best but the ability to create them is quite easy if you are technical and you have the development skills um but it is still a development it is still a development um right here back in we go for the next round 
Um, so we've executed action, we're getting a record. So this is very similar to listing items in a table, but this time it's just one record. And the reason why you may want to do one record is, again, if you only need one record, I would always do get an action, because then you don't have to do loops within the next steps of Empower or Automate. Um, because if you do list a record, even if there's only one result, you will then have to go for everything will be done in a in a loopy sort of process, which you, you kind of want to avoid. Similar sort of setup as to um, get uh, listing entities or creating a record or deleting a record. Again, we want to mention our environment. Oh, it's 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 upset with me now. The internet is not coping. Okay, here and then we're going to say what we're going to connect to. So again, we're going to use the customers, uh, the customer v3 one as well, because we're, you know, why mess up a good thing? Oh, getting my text is all over the place. We'll, we'll just scroll down to it. You know what it's called. It is in alphabetical order. That's the nice thing about it. Okay, so the object ID. If you don't know what you need to do, just put in a default one. And again, you're going to get that error message, which is going to tell you what you need to do. Um, so in this example, we know it's going to be USMF, and it's going to be that number there, 006. Okay, so if I save that, and I test that in, um, we'll perform the trigger now. That's going to pull out that information for us. Okay, so here we are. It's got on the record for us. If I copy this information here and put it into Notepad++, I can see we've just got on the one record here. If I scroll all the way up slowly, well, fairly slowly. There's a lot of fields on a customer. There's a lot of fields. Um, here we are. We have customer number 26. So that's a cute little feature. I really, really like this one. It's really, really useful for when you only need to be talking about one record, sending one record to an email or to an approval process. It's really super duper useful. Um, and what you can do is you can create a record and then get a record after that. Because what we can do if we link in create a record, um, which I find a lot of fun. You can have so much fun with this, I tell you. Um, go customers v there we go okay so all the fields that we create in our create a record step here under i can then link it in so if i don't know what my customer number is that's okay i can just leave it blank and then i can search for customer number under my create a record it should be here somewhere oh it's called account to get the right thing so I can then link it in so I create it get all that default goody good stuff happening in my create step and then bring that into my actionable steps after then so lots and lots of fun well I think it's lots of fun anyway um the same thing happens with legal entity parameters particularly when you're creating a record or getting a record it needs to be your default entity unless it has been enabled for that extra information Right, we're almost finished with our actions here, and then we'll talk about our lovely little trigger that we have. Okay, so getting a list of entities. That's all right if you're starting off and you can have a look at all the entities. I do find that sometimes you get lost in the details and you're not quite sure what to do or where to go. Um, so when you do get all your entities, it is just going to ask you for your environment. It's not going to ask you for much else. Even once it's loaded that in, that's all you're going to get. Um, this one I feel is probably more useful for the techie people than it is for us functional um, users. It's a little bit, okay, yeah, yeah, I have my list of entities, but how will I know exactly which one I need to use? It can sometimes be a bit hard because if you think about it, items, for example, items have a million different entities that we need to be updating to create that released product. So knowing which one it is, is it item batch attribute? No, it's not. That's got something to do altogether differently. So 
Sometimes getting the list of entities I find to be a little bit confusing and overwhelming as a functional. And that's why I love this open in Excel functionality, because this is what I should be doing with Power Automate. Um, I should be getting it to do stuff that I as a functional user would do, not as a development interface. Radio. Ah, oh, there's always going to be people that disagree with me, though. Everyone has their own opinion. This is this is all my opinion, by the way. So just mine. Okay, uh, lucky last one, I do believe. Okay. Okay, which is updating a record. And that's exactly what you think it's going to be. If you notice, it looks identical to the previous ones that we have done. Um, so again, we need our environment. You're going to know what my environment is by now, aren't you? And then we choose the entity. So it's customers with an S, V3. Okay, again, our object ID. If you don't know what your object ID is, just put in some gobbledygook or put in pink unicorns and get it to run. And from there, it will then tell you the fields that it needs. But we know it's USMF and it is hopefully... Oh, oh, oh no, that's not it. Um, <laughs> we go to customer number. There it is, USMF, comma, no spaces. Remember, no spaces and there. Now that that's in, you can then choose the information that you want to update. And this is why getting a record first before updating a record may be useful because these little compulsory fields have to be updated, have to be there. So that's why I often like to get my record first. Uh, we're not going to type it in actually, uh, just for, for saving time. Um, so I want to get my record first so I can hyperlink these information in or dynamic link that information in. And then from there, I can then just, you know, nothing else is compulsory. I can put in my sales tax group. Actually, I don't know what the UK, US sales tax groups are. Um, we'll search for payment delivery terms. We'll find some payment terms. We know that they're net 30. Um, it's not base days. Terms of payment, net 30. Okay, we can save that and we can then run it. And it's going to update that record that we created with 30 days or oh, payment terms of net 30 as well again just because I'm manually typing it doesn't mean you have to definitely make use of the dynamic information that's really really useful so that's finished updating and if I go back into this record and refresh this beautiful little thing um, if I scroll down to where my payment terms are hiding I always forget if this is under payment. You think it'd be under payment. Here it is. Net 30 has now populated. So those are the actions that we can do with Power Automate. So again, we have the basic ones we can create, we can read, we can update, we can list. They're the main ones you're going to use. I don't recommend delete. It's got too many ifs and buts associated with it. And they're really, really useful. Um, but sometimes you need the Power Automate to trigger from within finance and operations. And that's where we have one beautiful little trigger called business and it's called business events. Now, the system comes with a bucket load, eh, a bucket of business events. No, it comes with a bunch of business events. Um, of course, in true forms, there won't be a business event for what you need it for. Um, but like actions, they are easily developed. So you just need to delete and we're going to click on the Dynamics 365. Remember the purple one, not the other ones, the purple one. That being said, I assure you, once I publish this, it's going to change, isn't it? But you want to make sure when a business event occurs. So a business event could be any sort of things. Maybe it's a workflow starting. Maybe it's a purchase order being confirmed. Maybe it's an invoice being posted. These are all things that when they happen in the system, it can then trigger a power automate. So I'm going to again connect to my environment. Okay. So this environment is a purely vanilla standard environment, which is really useful because um, it's going to get you and figure out what you can do. Now, just so here we have a bunch. We have some around asset management, purchase ledger, purchase orders, sales ledger, sales orders and workflow. This is your Jedi jail free card is alert. So every, you can create a whole bunch of custom alerts and get the business event to trigger off an alert. Again, remember, this is all around self use. OK, so it's not something that's 100 percent applicable if you want to incorporate it for the whole enterprise. If you are doing enterprise wide based alerts, you don't want to base it off a custom thing that you can personalize. You want to have something developed. 
So if we have a look, for example, you notice there's no general ledger. Journals, we get missed out. Um, one day, one day we're going to be able to post a journal. Um, but if we select purchase ledger, for example, we can then see all the events that we have. So we can have if an invoice journal is posted or an invoice register is posted as well. Um, or here we go, the registered invoice or the pending invoices, anything time there's something posted or a payment has been posted as well. So we have some nice little ones under purchase ledger, which are quite useful. And under sales ledger, we have similar sort of ones as well. Um, the in, uh, payment has been posted, a transaction has been written off, or maybe we've got a collection letter that's um, being created as well. So that's quite useful as well. And the purchase order ones are not the best, if I'm honest with you, but they are getting better. We can have it if it's been confirmed or received. Okay, that's cool. Um, and the sales order ones are pretty similar as well. Um, again, a business, if an invoice has been created. I would appreciate more on the sales orders, but that will come with time. You know, this, is, this has improved. Um, all right, and then you need to then specify the legal entity that this needs to be focused on. Um, it's not the best at doing multiple legal entities. It is getting better, um, but we're still, you know, baby steps, darlings, baby steps. Um, on here, you can just select one. You can't do multiples. You would have to do multiple business events for each of this. Once you've got your business events, you can then go off and do whatever your heart desires. So that is a very quick overview stop of the triggers and the actions the very best way to get started and i'm gonna i'm gonna sound like a typical power platform here is to use the templates and believe it or not there is actually finance and operation templates we have what five we have five we're finally being considered and they are cool so what we have here is we have the ability if you have a workflow item we can send it off through the power automate approvals which takes the approval element outside of finance and operations so you can use the really funky little finance and operations app itself um, we have the ability to get some records and feed it into CDS. Um, that's really cool. Being a bit replaced by dual right, if I'm honest with you, but you know, it is, it is fairly interesting. Um, and we also have the ability to send off an email when something happens within finance and operations, another nice little template. And again, we can, this one's similar. It's just two different PU versions. Always go with the latest. Don't go with an earlier version. Um, and this one is just sending an email when something happens within finance and operations. So let's do the most complicated one, which is this one. And I'm going to show you how simple it is to get yourself set up with these standard templates. So it's going to say, OK, well, this is what's happening. And it gives you a little bit of a blurb here. I'm not going to read it out for you because you're all very capable. If you made it here, you're capable of reading. And we're just going to click on continue. Okay, so this is creating our lovely little environment. And you know, the best thing about this is it's all pre-done. Um, so all you really have to do is you have to select our environment. Okay, and it's got our category or defaulted for us. Um, and all we need to do now is we need to select our business event. That hasn't been approved. Oh, we need to choose the workflow because this is looking at a particular workflow. So I need to come down and have a look at, these are going to be all my different little workflows that I have. So my ledger daily journal um, workflow number 131. I'll select that. And then I'll select the legal entity that it's associated to. OK, so that's when the business and uh, business event happens, which is our workflow item in journal 131. Oh, sorry, not journal 131, workflow 131. We'll need to see what workflow that what journal name that workflow is assigned to. We're then going to pass the JSON because we essentially this is going to feed the information into flow and in like this little string. Um, and that's not going to help us because we need to filter things and we need to check things. So that's why we want to what we call pass the JSON. And the really lovely thing is that it's already set up in here for you. There's a lot of documentation around business events. The community, when it first came out, got really super excited, which let's be honest, it's awesome. Um, so I'll try to find some some YouTube links around that or at least some some blogs around how to pass JSON with business events. 
Okay, so then we're going to validate the item. That's always good practice. So we, all we have to do here is type in our environment. You may want to just copy because that's going to take time. Now, you may get this bad gateway, and that's just it. Give it a moment. It just needs to load. It, it, it's just it's a bit slow in the morning or in the evening. And from here, essentially, it's got all the information from you. We can have a look at the outcomes. We can check, see what the title is and the details. And we've got the link as well. So all of this is just automatically configured for you. You don't have to do anything. We can just sit back and relax. Um, so it's going to send off an approval. And it's going to, for each response, again, we need to mess, put in our link, UKES peep. There we go, and it's going to execute our action, which is completing off our workflow item with the relevant information. And that's all you have to do. From here, we can save, and we can now start to use this workflow. It is up and good and ready to go. And that's the beauty of these templates. They are really, really cool. And hopefully, within time, we'll get a bit more finance and operation templates, which I really do enjoy. Hopefully, I have tempted you into looking into finance and operations and how we can use the flow connector yes i know that there are a lot of limitations around it but from a functional point of view or an end user point of view it is a fantastic self-service tool which is really what it's designed for um there's this all these sorts of awesome things that you can do from it, such as uploading exchange rates, using it to upload a journal automatically for you, or to get send yourself emails or different alerts as well. It's around getting yourself out of the finance and operations and using finance and operations data in your day-to-day -day activities without without stress. Um, I think it's worth a lot of love. Um, I think it's getting better. I appreciate that if you are technical, you can use HTTP calls and that's fantastic. But for the non-technical people around here, the ability to connect to those automate flows to not have to remember what the next number sequence is or what default information is, is really, really powerful. And I think it's a fantastic tool to use. Rightio. I hope you've enjoyed this and I will catch you next time. Bye.